Uh, welcome to General Conference Conversations, the podcast where we have conversations about General Conference. I'm your host, Kaylin, and I'm super excited to be here with you, studying the words of our living prophets, apostles, and chosen leaders. I've loved listening to podcasts about Come Follow Me, and I saw a need for a podcast centered around the General Conference talks. Um, I'm not a scholar, I'm not an expert, I'm a 20 something who just simply adores the gospel. The things I discuss are my opinions. Um, as one of my favorite podcasts, at last she said it often says, your mileage may vary. In addition to my connections and thoughts, I will include a list of questions at the end of every episode as a place to start with your own deeper study of each talk. And I hope this podcast will be a jumping off point as you apply these principles to your life. In that spirit, I invite you to read and study today's talk before listening to this episode. Listen for what the Lord is saying to you personally. Then come join me for a beautiful discussion together. Hello, hello. That is one of the last times I'll say that for this conference, which is so crazy. We are on our second to last talk of April conference. And the next episode will actually be our last. Um, We'll go through Elder, or sorry, President Nelson's talk and then do a little recap of everything this this conference. So, but today, um, we're reading Elder Uchtdorf's talk, Our Heartfelt All. Um, And of course, I encourage you to listen to or read this talk on your own before coming and listening to me ramble on and on about it. So, um, I'm going to jump right in. I really loved this talk a lot. Um, Elder Uchtdorf has a way of inspiring in a very, like, compassionate way. Um, just the way that he speaks and the way that he talks about things. And just like the reassurances that he gives, and he also just like a very soothing presence and very soothing voice, and very distinct. So like as I was reading this, I could hear him saying all the words. It was in my head. It was great. So anyway, so he starts off by talking about the widow who um, gave in. He's she's doing just two mites. Um, while, well, you know, everybody else in the temple was throwing in gobs and gobs of money. And he says it was such a small amount, it would hardly be worth recording. And yet this seemingly in- inconsequential donation caught the Savior's attention. In fact, it impressed him so deeply that he called unto him his disciples and saith unto him, unto them, verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all she had, even all her living. He goes on to say a little later, To the Lord the value of the donation was measured not by the effect it had on the treasury, but by the effect it had on the heart of the donor. And... I don't know, all of that. Like right before that, he says, with his, the simple observation, the Savior taught us how offerings are measured in his kingdom. And it's quite different from the way we usually measure things. And I'm sure I've talked about like blessings on here before on this podcast and um, my relationship with blessings, like being blessed by the Lord, how I look at blessings as the things that change me, not necessarily things that I get. Um... And this made me think of, we had tithing declaration, my husband and I had tithing declaration last Sunday, we met with our bishop, and we're new in our ward, we've been here a couple of months, but, you know, not, not super long enough to have, like, a really good, like, to have gotten to know the bishop super well, and so we haven't met with him a couple, very many times, and he's like, I don't know you very well, but, like, tell me about yourselves, kind of catching up and, you know, meeting, just, just counseling with us. And, of course, it was Tithing Declaration. And he talked about... Um, t- 
tithing for him, he's, he's like, I've been married 28 years, and for the first 24, I was less active, inactive. It's like, I came to church maybe once a month. Um, it was the same thing that my dad did growing up. Um, he's a rancher, and so, you know, you have to have, have to take care of your cattle, and you have to get crops in on time, and um, he was like, it was a better, bigger, bigger commitment to the ranch than it was to the church. And like so four years ago, my bishop called me to be elders quorum president. And he was like, you're kidding me. You're absolutely kidding. Like, I'm here once a month at best. You know, I, I, I don't, I can't do that. The bishop was like, but your name came back from like everybody. Your name just kept coming back. And so he's like, the Lord wants you to do this, but you are going to have to make changes. And he was talking about, he's like, he did. He's like, I did. I, I, I made a goal. I came to church every week. Now I'm bishop. <laughs> like, but he's like, but for those 24 years, I still paid my tithing every month. I was always on top of my tithing. And he's like, it sounds weird, but, you know, I, I knew that, that the Lord knew that I was doing the best I could. That at the time, just paying my tithing was all that I could do. That was where I was spiritually, that's where I was physically, that's where I was mentally. And it was such a beautiful testimony of tithing that, and he talked about tithing as being your relationship with God. And not like a sign of proving your worth to God by paying the most tithing or whatever, but, you know, but you're giving your, your offering to him, um, of, you know, 10% of your increase, which is really hard to give away your money. And I just really loved that, like, that he was like, but it had an effect on me. It wasn't just, oh, now I pay, I pay my tithing, so now I can go to the temple. Oh, I pay my tithing, so... I, I get to keep my recommend, or I don't get looked at weird, or, you know, I get the blessings, or whatever. It's like, I paid my tithing because it was my relationship with God at the time. That's who I was. And so I love that. Like, the, the value of the donation was measured not by the effect it had on the treasury, but the effect it had on the heart of the donor. So I wanted to ask, something like tithing that is very physical, I feel like that, and, like, the word of wisdom, right, um are very physical things that the Lord asks us to do, that we are expected to do as members of the church. Um, whereas, you know, other sacrifices, other things um, are more spiritual, like reading our scriptures every day or going to church, which are still physical things, um, but they're very obviously easily linked to spiritual things. And so is tithing in the word of wisdom, obviously, but I feel like sometimes it... The um <clears throat> the relationship between the physical and the spiritual get a little bit lost with like word of wi- with the word of wisdom and tithing tongue twister. Um, so I wanted to ask like what what effect does something like tithing have on you? I don't not not what blessings have you seen from paying tithing? Not what blessings have you seen from you know paying your um uh, following the word of wisdom. But, like, what effect has it had on you and your relationship with God and your spiritual health? Not just your financial health, not your mental health, not your physical health, your spiritual health. Um, tithing is hard for me. I'm going to be honest. We don't make a lot of money. And especially the last few months, we've been living on savings. And um, it's really hard to even think about paying tithing on top of all of our bills and insurance and all of that right like just no not not fun but hearing and I've I've always had it linked to tithing is a physical thing like you get blessings from tithing like you get financial blessings or whatever but I just love the way he the, the bishop talked about it was so was so personal and so beautiful. So I want you guys to think about that. What effect does tithe, something like tithing or something like the word of wisdom have on you? Um, he goes on to say, it's kind of going along saying, Jesus taught that our offering may be large or it may be small, but either way, it must be our heartfelt all. Um, 
<laughs> and so he goes on to say, but how is this possible? To many of us, such a standard of whole-souled commitment seems out of reach. We are already stretched so thin. How can we balance the many demands of life with our desires to offer our whole souls to the world? To the Lord. Sorry, not the Lord. The Lord. I read this and I said, mm, Albert Richter, if you read my mind. I, there's a lot that we do in a day, right? There's a lot that we have to, have to, quote unquote, squeeze in 24 hours. Eating, showering, working, cleaning, taking care of kids if you have kids, taking care of grandkids if you have grandkids, dogs, pets, car maintenance, like all of the day-to-day things that really quickly fill up 24 hours, right? And so I want to think, do you feel like this? Did, did he also speak to your soul <laughs> as he spoke to mine? How is this possible? You know, we're already stretched so thin. How can we balance the many demands of life with our desires to offer our whole souls to the world? So he says, perhaps our challenge is what we think balance means. Sorry. Is that we think balance means dividing our time evenly among competing interests. Viewed in this way, our commitment to Jesus Christ would be one of many things we need to fit into our busy schedules. But perhaps there is another way to look at it. And he starts talking about riding bicycles. He and his wife ride uh, bikes together. And he talks about, like, these important, these are the important tips on staying balanced on a bicycle. Don't look at your feet, look ahead. Keep your eyes on the road in front of you. Focus on your destination and get pedaling. Staying balanced is all about moving forward. Um, and he says, how to distribute your time and energy among many important tasks will vary from person to person and from one season of life to another. But our common overall objective is to follow the way of our master, Jesus Christ, and learn and return to the presence of our beloved Father in heaven. This objective must remain constant and consistent, whoever we are and whatever else is happening in our lives. So I'm reading a book right now, um, which I was actually going to talk about. I'll talk about a little bit later as well, but um, I'm just reminded of something in that book here as well. So it's a book by Chieko Okazaki. It's called Lighten Up. Uh, she was, well, she served on the presidencies of, I think, all three organization general presidencies. Uh, or as their president? No, I can't remember. At the very least, she was in all three general presidencies for the women's organizations, <clears throat> uh, primary young women's, and I know for a fact she was the Relief Society general president for a while, in the 90s, I believe, late 90s, early 2000s. Anyway, uh, she's amazing, and I love her writing, and her story is really cool, um, she was also the first non-Caucasian woman to serve on any of the general boards, and then the first non-Caucasian woman to serve on any of the <clears throat> general presidencies. So, big deals, big cool things. She has this one chapter, though, that I just read a few days ago, um, called In Principle, Great Clarity, In Practice, Great Charity. And... It's really what it sounds like, but um, she talks about, like, the principle behind why we do things is more important than the practice. So, like, being very clear in our principle, being very clear in, you know, she made these, the, or she gave the, um, what's the word, example of raising children. That, you know, the principle behind all of these families raising their children was raising them to be disciples of Christ, to be good humans, right? The practice for all of those families looks very different. They're all different families. They're all different people. Um, they have different interests. They have different sporting events they have to go to. They have different jobs. You know, five out of seven families might have... FHE on Monday and the other two have it on a different day of the week because one of their parents works on Monday nights or they always have soccer practice on Monday nights or you know on and on and on 
And so I just really love that. She's like having clarity in principle and charity in practice to, you know, to remember that not everybody's like you. And so they're not going to live their lives the way that you live. And so, but I just love that also is like, he points that out, how to distribute your time and energy among your many important tasks will vary from person to person and from one season of life to another, which I also love that, and I've talked about this here before, on my mission, I studied one to two hours a day. Now, I'm lucky if I study for 15 minutes. Some, some days are more, some days are less. Um, and I know in six months, a year, ten years, my study will look different. Maybe I'll go back to reading an hour a day. Maybe I'll stop listening to podcasts and I'll listen to something else. Maybe I, like, whatever, right? Like, it's going to look different from me to my husband and also me to me. Like, it's going, my, my gospel study, the way that I arrange my life, um, the things that are of most importance in my day is going to look different from month to month, from year to year. Um, but I love what he talks, what he's talking about in here is, um, that like keep moving forward and keep your eyes on the goal of Christ. And, and then he goes on to talk about airplanes, of course. (laughs) Um, and he says, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not just one of many things we do. The Savior is the motivating power behind all that we do. He is not a rest stop in our journey. He is not a scenic byway or even a major landmark. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by Jesus Christ. That is the way and our ultimate destination. Balance and lift come as we press forward with steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. And so I love this, I love this principle, right? That all we do should be infused with the gospel, with Christ, with that goal of becoming more like him. And we've talked about this before as well. Um, that, you know, it's not just our studies that should be focused on Christ, but we should be looking for opportunities to testify of him. Even if that doesn't, even if that means, like, we're not actually talking about him, right? Like, we <laughs> we are showing Christ like love to others. We are um serving God by serving his children, even if we don't ever talk about Christ. Like today, I took cookies to a neighbor who is not a member of the church. Um, we didn't talk about anything about the church. She came back, she wasn't home when I took her took the cookies the first time, so she came back over and she brought me vegetables from her garden. On a sweet little note. And we talked for a few minutes. And she was a nice, nice lady. Like, we have a connection now. Like, I hadn't met her before. Um, but it was nice just to, like, hang out <laughs> for a few minutes. And to serve someone, to give them cookies, even if that was really... And she served me back. Like, I love fresh garden vegetables. I'm so excited for my cucumbers and my tomato. <laughs> like... I'm going to make a salad, and I'm not even, like, a salad person. Um, but, anyway, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but, but I, lo- I love that. He's like, he's, like, Christ is not the scenic bra- byway. He's not the rest stop. He's not a landmark. He is the road. He is the way. He is in every facet of our lives. Um... <clears throat> And going back to the widow, like, that is what's changing us. It's it's not what we give, it's how we give it. And how we notice him in everything that we do. And we try to invoke him in all that we do. Um, And then he talks about the difference between sacrifice and consecration, which I really enjoyed because... So if you've gone through the temple, two of the covenants that you make as a law of sacrifice and law of consecration. And I'm like, isn't that the same thing? <laughs> like, um, okay. But he, 
he says these the two laws are similar but not identical. He says to sacrifice means to give something up in favor of something more valuable. Consecration is different from sacrifice in at least one important way. When we consecrate something, we don't leave it to be consumed upon the altar. Rather, we put it to use in the Lord's service. We dedicate it to him and his holy purposes. We receive the talents the Lord has given us and strive to increase them manifold to become even more helpful in building the Lord's kingdom. And oh, and then he says, Very few of us will ever be asked to sacrifice our lives for the Savior, but we are all invited to consecrate our lives to him. And I liked that distinction a lot. Like I, it made me think about it differently. Right, like sacrifice is to give something up. To give it up, to say I'm not going to do this anymore, to burn it on the altar, to whatever, right? To sacrifice it. To consecrate is to have something and you're not giving it up, you're using it in a way to serve the Lord. Which is so cool. I mean, both are cool, right? Um, I mean, he goes on, oh, I was going to ask though. How do these definitions help you think differently about your temple covenants or just these words in general? Like if you haven't gone to the temple, um, we use the word sacrifice and consecrate a lot in the church. So how do these definitions help you to think about them differently? And if you have gone to the temple, how, how, do that, how does that help you think about the covenants that you've made differently as well? Um... So he talks about, as we seek to purify our lives and look unto Christ in every thought, everything else begins to align. Life no longer feels like a long list of separate events, sorry, separate efforts held in tenuous balance. Over time, it all becomes one work, one joy, one holy purpose. It is the work of loving and serving God. It is loving and serving God's children. And I just, I just adore that. That that is our that is our holy purpose is to love God and love our neighbors. And that we can do that in a million different ways. And it's gonna look different for every person, and it's gonna look different from for every person from one day to the next. Um But this is kind of his like his zinger is this is how we offer our whole souls. By sacrificing anything that's holding us back and consecrating the rest to the Lord and his purposes. And I just adore that. Like, I don't even know what I'm going to say about that. I do, but I don't know. Let's think in for a second. Sacrificing anything that's holding us back and consecrating the rest to the Lord and his purposes. We're trying to rid ourselves of things that hold us back, but then using everything else to serve him. And to use it in his in his service and his love for his children and for him. Um, <clears throat> and oh, what was I gonna say? Ah, I so this is the other thing from this book that I've been reading. Um, the chapter I just read this morning, she talks about limitations. And how our limitations we can often see as a blessing. Which is hard for me. (laughs) Seeing my limitations as a blessing. But the way she talked about it was really cool. So, um, she's a Japanese American. Uh, She was born and raised in Hawaii. Her parents um, were from Japan. And... And then she moved to Utah with her husband to teach school. And she's like, at the time, it was pretty close to after like World War II and all of that craziness. And like, there wasn't a whole lot of diversity in Utah at the time. And so, especially with Japanese Americans, right? Everything in World War II happened understandable not great but understandable to a point <clears throat> um so she was uh, teaching second grade and right before the school year started 
her principal came in and was like, I'm really sorry, Jaco. Three of the parents, um, three of, my goodness, three students in your class, their parents asked um, to switch their kids to a different class because they don't want um, a, a Japanese teacher for their children. And so she was like, okay, that's fine. Like, that's their wishes. It's totally chill. I'll love whoever comes into my class. So the first day of school, um, she was like, I'm going to just go with it. I can, I'm, I'm going to embrace being Japanese and exotic and from Hawaii. And I'm going to just, that's, that's, that's who I am. I'm going to embrace it. And so she did. And it was their custom to go out on the playground and like call all their children um, that were in their, in their class and then take them into the classroom. And so she went first and she was wearing this bright dress and a flower in her hair and she's like I called every child forward uh their parents were there a lot of their parents were there I called every child forward and I made a comment about something of like oh that's such a pretty name oh your hair looks so nice you know you tied your shoes so perfectly and um <laughs> the principal came in after the first day or first week or whatever and she said, those three parents want their kids back in your class. And she said, no, you had your chance. You know, those those spots have been taken. And so her whole point was, like, her Japanese-ness, being Japanese, um, was a bit of a, li- as a limitation. Those, those parents saw it as a limitation. Like, oh, I don't, I don't want my kids in your class. Those 35 kids in her class very well all could have said, I don't want my kids in your class. She could have not been even hired. Like, big deals. But, um, she used her limitation, quote unquote, to, um, to do something amazing. To, she consecrated it. She consecrated her limitation to the Lord. And so she was asking, she said, what in your life do you think is a limitation that could be used to serve God? And she's like, obviously there are things spiritually, mentally, whatever, that is going to keep us from, um, that is going to keep us from progressing spiritually, right? But there are things that, that we, you know, we view as limitations that can be used to serve the Lord. Um, and she talked about like physical like disabilities or poverty or something like that. And she's like, think about that and think about what you could use that for, for good. And I immediately thought about my anxiety. Um, I think I've talked about it on here before. I have um, social anxiety and generalized, well, it's generalized anxiety disorder with an emphasis in social anxiety. <laughs> uh, I specialize in it. Now, um, and a lot of, obviously a lot of that holds me back. There's a lot that, especially spiritually, that there's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of, um, trust issues with a lot of things. But there has been good f- that's come from it. Um, I've been able to connect with a lot of people who also have anxiety and and help them to feel seen, and they've helped me to feel seen, to, to talk about that, and to, you know, share what's, what's worked for me, what's helped for me, just so many things, and so I, I don't have all the answers yet, (laughs) of course, um, and it was just this morning I started thinking about this, but like, you know, how, how can I consecrate that, how can I sacrifice the things that are unhelpful about my anxiety, and consecrate what is helpful, what can be helpful about my anxiety. And that just blew my mind. Anyway. Um, and then, of course, he ends with such a sweet testimony. I love Elder Dorf. He says, My dear brothers and sisters and my dear friends, there will be times when you wish you could do more. Your loving Father in Heaven knows your heart. He knows that you can't do everything your heart wants you to do. But... You can love and serve God. You can do your best to keep his commandments. You can love and serve his children. 
and your efforts are purifying your heart and preparing you for a glorious future. This is what the widow at the temple of treasury seemed to understand. She surely knew that her offering would not change the fortunes of Israel, but it could change and bless her, because though small, it was her all. And it's just such a sweet little reminder, right? Like, you know, I know that you'll want to do more. God knows that you want to do more. God knows your heart. And he knows that you can't physically always do everything that your heart desires. But he knows that you're trying. He knows that you can love him and serve him. You can keep his commandments. He can love and serve his children. And those efforts are what's going to change you. Those efforts are what's going to bring you closer to him. Um, and yeah, I just... I love Elder Dorf and the way that he speaks is just so beautiful. So um, let me recap my, re, not recap, recap my questions, goodness. So the first one was about, well, about the widow's might. Um, we talked about how sometimes the um, relationship between the physical and the spiritual of, you know, tithing and the word of wisdom can get blurred sometimes. And so what effect does something like tithing have on you? Not blessings that you've seen from it, but what? how have you changed because of something like tithing or the word of wisdom? And then, of course, this quote, how is this possible? To many of us, such a standard of whole-souled commitment seems out of reach. We are already stretched so thin. How can we balance the main demands of life with our desires to offer our whole souls to the Lord? Do you feel like this? Do you feel like you're stretched so thin you can't do anything else? Um, and think about what that balance means. Think about what we've talked about. That it's not adding more. It's just changing your intention. The way that you think about things. Speaking about thinking about things differently. Um, we talked about the difference between sacrifice and consecration. Um... How do those definitions help you think differently about those words and concepts? And if you've gone to the temple, um, how that how does that wow, how do those definitions help you to think differently about your covenants specifically? And of course, as always, um, listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Um, maybe there's something I read that stood out to you, maybe there's something uh, in, a qu- in a question that has sparked your interest, um, maybe there was something that you read or the question that you had come to mind as you were sitting on your own, pay attention to that. Um, it's important. So I will talk to y'all next episode, which will be our last episode before uh, this coming conference. So that's super exciting. I'll talk to y'all then. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of General Conference Conversations. Be sure to follow and share us on um, any social media. And if you like the show, feel free to leave us a review or tell your friends. Until next time.